Good afternoon, great to be with you at this last of our Wednesday Lent gatherings and opportunity to keep our eyes focused on all the Lord did to come and be our Savior. Thanks for being here today, kids. Thanks for the great song that was part of our worship today, beautiful words and music. Tonight we spend some time in the words of John 19. You'll see him printed on page 7. And uh, John 19, beginning at verse 14, uh, we hear these words. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. This is the word of God. Whenever I find myself in the season of Lent and all the events of Holy Week coming up, I always find my heart and mind most often drawn to the words of Isaiah chapter 53. Maybe you'll remember those words, words that talk about how Jesus was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Uh, words that, although they were written 700 years before Jesus came, give such great detail about the suffering and death that our Lord Jesus would go through. Those words not only talk about all the, the things that would happen to him, but they also talk about how people would be looking at Jesus and the attitude they would have toward him. And so Isaiah 53 says, He was despised and rejected, a man of suffering. He was like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Those words reveal the, the heart and the attitude of those that would be calling for Jesus' death on that Good Friday. Not only did those words predict what Jesus would face, but Jesus himself did it. Many times he told his disciples about what he would have to endure that when they went to Jerusalem, the things that would happen and how he would need to suffer and to die. Those words of prophecy of, in the Old Testament, those words of prophecy from our Lord Jesus himself, are fulfilled in the words of John that we look at here today. And those words of the crowd that said, take him away, crucify him. How different the crowd's message was that day compared to what it had been only a few days earlier on Palm Sunday. When Jesus had come riding into town on a donkey, the crowds were glad to see him. They were singing Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They, they had a parade and, and celebrated Jesus. They wanted to be around him. They were glad he was there. But things were very different come Good Friday. Those words of praise and blessing from the crowds had turned to shouts of anger, hearts of hatred, and those that now called for Jesus' death. So how can we even account for that? Why is there this sudden change? Was it something Jesus did? Well, let's think about it. What was it that Jesus had done? He had healed the sick. He made the blind be able to see. He had fed thousands with food that they didn't have with them. He had even done miracles to bring dead people back alive. Any of those things bad? Reason to hate him? Well, if it wasn't something Jesus said, maybe it was something, or something he did, maybe it was something he said. Well, what did Jesus say? What kind of things came out of his mouth? Only the word of God. 
correctly spoken, truthfully explained, only words that help people better understand the Old Testament and how it connected to what he was here to do as our Savior? Is there any evil in any of that? No, Jesus found himself in the situation that he told his disciples the night before would be the case, that the people would hate him without reason. You know, it's interesting how many people in our world today believe that people are basically good, that we're naturally good or at least come into this world as a blank slate that is going to turn out how we do based on our environment and the influences we have in life. In fact, a Harvard psychologist recently said that we all have a true self that is kind, compassionate, caring, curious, and calm. As much as a worldly view would like to think that everybody's basically good, we see in what happened with Jesus and with that crowd on Good Friday what the sinful heart is truly capable of. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 said, the sinful mind is hostile to God. And when you look at the crowd and you look at their hearts and, and, and the way they looked at Jesus, the Son of God, that day, there was perhaps no other day that there was as great of a hostility given toward the innocent Son of God. So why? What drove the crowd to such madness? What drove them to such anger? Well, the crowd was being led by the religious leaders of the day. Religious leaders who saw Jesus as a threat. You see, the religious leaders, they, they liked what they had. They liked being in power. They liked being in charge. They liked being able to, to tell people what to do. They liked having a, a little bit of a sense of peace and security that they were trying to hold things together with. They saw Jesus as a threat to all of that. They thought Jesus was going to mean that they'd lose their job, that the Romans would be upset, that they'd see Jesus as some kind of a rebellion. In fact, the high priest we hear earlier in the book of John said, that if we let Jesus go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Religious leaders didn't want to lose the, the peace, the prosperity, the security, the power that they had. And what a sad situation that is. These are supposed to be the religious leaders. They should have been concerned with people's hearts. Concerned with people's relationship with God. They should have been concerned with, with people knowing better the Lord and, and how to have eternal life. But instead, what are they concerned about? The earthly, worldly, and temporal things that they had around them. And in fact, it even went so far to the point that John tells us here that they said, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar. The one who only a short time later would be attacking their city, who would be destroying the temple that they valued. Eventually he would level the entire city of Jerusalem and tell them that no Jew should set foot in it. That was the Caesar they wanted to be connected to rather than the true God. It's kind of ironic, really. They were getting ready to celebrate the Passover that week. And the Passover was the celebration of them getting out of slavery, celebrating the freedom from Egypt as they were led by Moses back to the Holy Land. And yet now what are they doing? They're really putting themselves back into slavery. They, they pledge themselves in servitude to Caesar and call for the death of the king of kings. We want nothing to do with him, they said. Take him away. Crucify him. Take him away. 
you and I maybe shudder to hear those words and are thankful that we weren't part of the crowd that day. Would we have been pulled into the frenzy of the crowd and found those same words coming from our lips? But you know, it doesn't take just being back in those days to have the same temptations that those people fell for be the things that you and I wrestle with in our lives today as well. Because the power of sin is able to get a hold of our hearts. That's why repentance is needed whenever our lives have gotten caught up in the things of this world. And we value too much the stuff that we have and the things that we're trying to get and the, the safety and the prosperity. God wants us to remember what he has for us beyond this world. It's repentance that's needed when we're not willing to take up our cross and follow him. Because sometimes being a Christian is hard and sometimes we're going to catch flack for it. Our God calls us to be faithful to him. Will we stay committed to him? Or will we get pulled away by the crowds and turn against the Lord? Thank goodness our salvation does not depend on our devotion, our zeal, our commitment to Christ. No, our salvation depends on his devotion, his commitment, and his zeal. And what a blessing we have in what that brought about. Because we have a Savior who willingly went to the cross. And when that pronouncement was made that you're going to be crucified and it's time to head out to make that happen. We don't hear that Jesus was, was fighting them and trying to get away and tugging on the ropes or chains. What does he do? He picks up his cross, his own cross, and starts following the procession out of town because he was willing to do what he knew had to be done. And so in quiet dignity, he moves forward to carry out God's plan bring forgiveness to you and me. Take him away. You know, this event is perhaps the greatest example of our God who is able to turn evil things into good. Romans 8 tells us that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Our God is able to take the the worst things of this world and the worst intentions and actions of others and bring about something great. And our Lord did that on that Good Friday. Although the crowds cried out in hatred for Jesus' death, although they shouted, take him away, our Lord Jesus was there to take away sin. Our Lord Jesus was there to be a demonstration of God's love and grace in your life and mine and for all the world. And in doing so, he worked as he always does, using his almighty to turn evil into good and to bring to you God's grace and mercy forever. Amen.